Book Twelve, Chapters Twenty Three through Thirty Two. Chapter Twenty Three. I have heard and considered these theories as well as my weak apprehension allows, and I confess my weakness to thee, O Lord, though already thou knowest it. Thus I see that two sorts of disagreements may arise when anything is related by signs, even by trustworthy reporters. There is one disagreement about the truth of the things involved, the other concerns the meaning of the one who reports them. It is one thing to inquire as to what is true about the formation of the creation. It is another thing, however, to ask what that excellent servant of thy faith, Moses, would have wished for the reader and hearer to understand from these words. As for the first question, let all those depart from me who imagine that Moses spoke things that are false. But let me be united with them in thee, O Lord, and delight myself in thee, with those who feed on thy truth in the bond of love. Let us approach together the words of thy book, and make diligent inquiry in them, for thy meaning, through the meaning of thy servant, by whose pen thou hast given them to us. Chapter 24 But in the midst of so many truths which occur to the interpreters of these words, understood as they can be in different ways, which one of us can discover that single interpretation which warrants our saying confidently that Moses thought thus, and that in this narrative he wishes this to be understood, as confidently as he would say that this is true, whether Moses thought the one or the other? For see, O my God, I am thy servant, and I have vowed in this book an offering of confession to thee, and I beseech thee that by thy mercy I may pay my vow to thee. Now, see, could I assert that Moses meant nothing else than this, that is, my interpretation, when he wrote, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, as confidently as I can assert that thou, in thy immutable word, hast created all things, invisible and visible. No, I cannot do this, because it is not as clear to me that this was in his mind when he wrote these things, as I see it to be certain in thy truth. For his thoughts might be set upon the very beginning of the creation when he said, In the beginning, and he might have wished it understood that, in this passage, heaven and earth refers to no formed and perfect entity, whether spiritual or corporeal, but each of them only newly begun and still formless. Whichever of these possibilities has been mentioned, I can see that it might have been said truly. But which of them did he actually intend to express in these words, I do not clearly see. However, whether it was one of these, or some other meaning which I have not mentioned, that this great man saw in his mind when he used these words, I have no doubt whatever that he saw it truly, and expressed it suitably. CHAPTER Twenty Five. Let no man fret me now by saying, Moses did not mean what you say, but what I say. Now, if he asks me, How do you know that Moses meant what you deduce from his words? I ought to respond calmly, and reply as I have already done, or even more fully if he happens to be untrained. But when he says, Moses did not mean what you say, but what I say, and then does not deny what either of us says, but allows that both are true, then, O oh my God, life of the poor, in whose breast there is no contradiction, pour thy soothing balm into my heart, that I may patiently bear with people who talk like this. It is not because they are godly men, and have seen in the heart of thy servant what they say, but rather they are proud men, and have not considered Moses' meaning, but only love their own, not because it is true, but because it is their own. Otherwise they could equally love another true opinion, as I love what they say, when what they speak is true, not because it is theirs, but because it is true, and therefore not theirs, but true. And if they love an opinion because it is true, it becomes both theirs and mine, since it is the common property of all lovers of the truth. But I neither accept nor approve of it, when they contend that Moses did not mean what I say, but what they say. And this because, even if it were so, such rashness is born not of knowledge, but of impudence. It comes not from vision, but from vanity. And therefore, O Lord, thy judgments should be held in awe, because thy truth is neither mine, nor his, nor any one else's, but it belongs to all of us whom thou hast openly called to have it in common, and thou hast warned us not to hold on to it as our own special property, for if we do we lose it. For if any one arrogates to himself what thou hast bestowed on all to enjoy, and if he desires something for his own that belongs to all, he is forced away from what is common to all to what is, indeed, his very own, that is, from truth to falsehood. For he who tells a lie speaks of his own thought. Hear, O God, best judge of all, O truth itself, hear what I say to this disputant. Hear it, because I say it in thy presence, and before my brethren, who use the law rightly, to the end of love. Hear and give heed to what I shall say to him, if it pleases thee. For I would return this brotherly and peaceful word to him. If we both see that what you say is true, and if we both say that what I say is true, where is it, I ask you, that we see this? Certainly I do not see it in you, and you do not see it in me, 
but both of us see it in the unchangeable truth itself, which is above our minds. If, then, we do not disagree about the true light of the Lord our God, why do we disagree about the thoughts of our neighbor, which we cannot see as clearly as the immutable truth is seen? If Moses himself had appeared to us and said, This is what I meant, it would not be in order that we should see it, but that we should believe him. Let us not, then, go beyond what is written, and be puffed up for the one against the other. Let us, instead, love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind, and our neighbor as ourself. Unless we believe that whatever Moses meant in these books he meant to be ordered by those two precepts of love, we shall make God a liar if we judge of the soul of his servant in any other way than as he has taught us. See now how foolish it is, in the face of so great an abundance of true opinions, which can be elicited from these words, rashly to affirm that Moses especially intended only one of these interpretations, and then, with destructive contention, to violate love itself, on behalf of which he had said all the things we are endeavouring to explain. CHAPTER Twenty Six, And yet, O my God, thou exaltation of my humility, and rest of my toil, who hearest my confessions, and forgivest my sins, since thou commandest me to love my neighbour as myself, I cannot believe that thou gavest thy most faithful servant Moses a lesser gift than I should wish and desire for myself from thee, if I had been born in his time, and if thou hadst placed me in the position where, by the use of my heart and my tongue, those books might be produced which so long after were to profit all nations throughout the whole world, from such a great pinnacle of authority, and were to surmount the words of all false and proud teachings. If I had been Moses, and we all come from the same mass, and what is man that thou art mindful of him? If I had been Moses, at the time that he was, and if I had been ordered by thee to write the book of Genesis, I would surely have wished for such a power of expression, and such an art of arrangement to be given to me, that those who cannot as yet understand how God createth, would still not reject my words as surpassing their powers of understanding. And I would have wished that those who are already able to do this, would find fully contained in the laconic speech of thy servant whatever truths they had arrived at in their own thought. And if, in the light of the truth, some other man saw some further meaning, that too would be found congruent to my words. CHAPTER Twenty Seven. For just as a spring dammed up is more plentiful, and affords a larger supply of water for more streams, over wider fields than any single stream let off from the same spring, over a long course, so also is the narration of thy minister. It is intended to benefit many who are likely to discourse about it, and, with an economy of language, it overflows into various streams of clear truth, from which each one may draw out for himself that particular truth which he can about these topics. This one that truth, that one another truth, by the broader survey of various interpretations. For some people, when they read or hear these words, think that God, like some sort of man, or like some sort of huge body, by some new and sudden decision, produced outside himself, and at a certain distance, two great bodies, one above, the other below, within which all created things were to be contained. And when they hear, God said, Let such and such be done, and it was done, they think of words begun and ended, sounding in time and then passing away, followed by the coming into being of what was commanded. They think of other things of the same sort, which their familiarity with the world suggests to them. In these people, who are still little children, and whose weakness is borne up by this humble language, as if on a mother's breast, their faith is built up healthfully, and they come to possess and to hold a certain the conviction that God made all entities that their senses perceive all around them in such marvellous variety. And if one despises these words as if they were trivial, and with proud weakness stretches himself beyond his fostering cradle, he will, alas, fall away wretchedly. Have pity, O Lord God, lest those who pass by trample on the unfledged bird, and send thy angel, who may restore it to its nest, that it may live until it can fly. CHAPTER Twenty Eight. But others, to whom these words are no longer a nest, but, rather, a shady thicket, spy the fruits concealed in them, and fly around rejoicing, and search among them, and pluck them with cheerful chirpings. For when they read or hear these words, O God, they see that all times past and times future are transcended by thy eternal and stable permanence, and they see also that there is no temporal creature that is not of thy making. By thy will, since it is the same as thy being, thou hast created all things, not by any mutation of will, and not by any will that previously was non-existent, and not out of thyself, but in thy own likeness, thou didst make from nothing the form of all things. This was an unlikeness which was capable of being formed by thy likeness, through its relation to thee, the one, as each thing has been given form appropriate to its kind, according to its preordained capacity. Thus all things were made very good, 
whether they remain around thee, or whether, removed in time and place by various degrees, they cause or undergo the beautiful changes of natural process. 